everyone. Welcome back to Mind Pump. In this episode, we talk about lifting heavy versus lifting light. The pros, the cons, what's better for building muscle, which is better for building strength. You're going to learn all about it right here in this episode. Finally, we have another channel. It's called Mind Pump Clips, where we've taken short segments from these longer episodes so that you can easily share them and enjoy them in a much shorter period of time. Go over to Mind Pump Clips and subscribe and enjoy the rest of this show. All right, check this out. There's two main ways to strength train. The first one is to make heavy weights feel light. The second one is to make light weights feel heavy. Both have tremendous value. I love this point, and I I know you did this as a fitness hmm. tip a while back, and um, I think it was our friend Ben Pakolsky I heard say it uh, like, you lift like a bodybuilder one way, and then you lift like a, a power lifter the other way. And in, in learning how to visualize what does that mean or what does that look like, is I, I thought was a really a powerful analogy for trying to teach uh, the average lifter what you mean. Those by are that. the two best examples because power lifters and bodybuilders both lift weights, right? They both strength train, they both build muscle, um, they both develop their bodies, uh, and they but both their intent do. Intent is completely different. It is, and they both do like similar exercises. I mean, there's definitely exercises bodybuilders do that powerlifters don't do. And, you know, there's certain exercises that powerlifters do that bodybuilders don't do much. But there's so much crossover, right? So, in fact, back in the day, uh, bodybuilders and powerlifters trained quite similarly back in the day. Um, and, and they both develop tremendous physiques. They both, you know, build lots of muscle, that stuff. But, boy, do they lift differently. And I don't mean differently as in different exercises and stuff like that necessarily – but even when you watch them do the same exercises, watch a bodybuilder do a bench press, watch a powerlifter do a bench press, watch a bodybuilder squat mm -hmm. versus a powerlifter, watch them do a row, watch them do even curls. Uh, where powerlifters don't do a lot of curls, but some of them do lots of curls, will do curls to protect their biceps for certain exercises like deadlifts. The intent and the technique are very different. And it's literally, it can be broken down like this. A powerlifter is always trying to make heavyweight feel as light as possible. And a bodybuilder is always trying to make a lightweight feel as heavy as possible. It's a very, very different approach to lifting. Well, I would also say that uh, bodybuilders very much pay attention to the feel of the muscle versus uh, the power lifter, the movement and the technique. Yes. Uh, and, and But that falls in line with, yes, they're trying to get, if you're a power lifter, you're trying to move the weight as efficiently uh, as possible with the, the least amount of, well, the maximal amount of effort that's necessary. Yeah. Uh, versus like a, a bodybuilder, you're gonna want to you're gonna want to make everything extra difficult uh, yeah. for your muscle to endure. Yeah. No, this wasn't in your notes to talk about this, but this conversation, I, I've thought about this conversation a lot, and curious to what you guys think. Do you think that one one of these characters, okay, so you have bodybuilder, you have powerlifter. Do you think one of them benefits more from training like the other than the other one does? Ooh. You understand what I'm asking? What mm. I'm asking? Yeah, really good question. Right? Like, oh, who, like who do you think gets when the, they cross over? Who has? Yes, the like biggest who gets response? like? So you have two different two different types of ways of training, and um, we we obviously we agree that both have mm, carryover, yeah. both see benefits. But do you think that one of them gets a little bit more benefits than the other one? I do. I'm just curious what you guys. Well, I'd like to hear what you have to say because because if I think. <laughs> super high level competitors it changes versus the typical like yeah not you know, a, not until let's see let's I can make the argument for power lifters actually going to bodybuilding and only from a longevity perspective so i i believe the the bodybuilder gets more benefit from learning to train like a power lifter than the power lifter gets from learning to train like a a, a bodybuilder hmm. why because the the the, the power lifter is not does not care how he looks at all, right. like he could have a, a big old beer belly or whatever like that. So getting uh, certain muscles to fire better from them d does not matter so much as it does moving the weight as efficiently as possible for their sport. Mm -hmm. So even though I do believe that they would get benefit from learning how to control specific muscles and to move out of that phase and feel the weight, right. I, I do like, like I don't disagree with that. I just think that the the bodybuilder though would get tremendous benefits from learning how to just move the bar. I think that he will build more muscle. Yeah. He will build more and building more muscle in the game of building an aesthetic physique tends to have more value than maybe the power. That's my I, my yeah, I, I think you can make an argument for that. My argument would be more around 
um, in terms of like joint health and longevity and, and um, you know, power lifters, it's just the risk reward goes up like quite substantially, especially over time. So to shift then into bodybuilding, That's a good point. I feel like they will be able to keep up their training going up into their 60s, 70s, 80s, like much more effectively than they would maintaining this yeah. like powerlifting. You know regime. what's interesting about this conversation is because I followed uh, both sports quite a bit when I was younger, and what's interesting is there's periods of time where bodybuilders will borrow or use more powerlifting <coughs> techniques, and then there's periods of time where powerlifters will borrow or use more of the bodybuilding techniques. Like, like I remember there was a period there where bodybuilder, or excuse me, powerlifters would talk about how just hypertrophy and growth contributed to their lifts. And so, you know, you should definitely go through kind of these these bodybuilding phases. I remember when power lifters, it was a big debate as to whether or not training the biceps was even important. And then power lifters said, well, yeah, look at these bicep tears that a lot of guys are getting, you know, doing these deadlifts. And so then they kind of start incorporating. And then there was periods where bodybuilders did lots of powerlifting um, cycles. And I mean, it was actually, you know, bodybuilding had a lot of powerlifting in the early days. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of went away to the point where bodybuilders didn't even do the big three lifts, maybe just bench press, but nobody deadlifted and squatted. And then you had periods of time when they did. Um, you know, Ronnie Coleman famously squatted and deadlifted, was also a powerlifter before he was ever a bodybuilder. And today you're seeing more bodybuilders, high-level bodybuilders start to incorporate <coughs> those movements because they're getting these, these huge results. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of, there's a lot of carryover and there's pros and cons to both. Now, when I think of the average lifter, when I think of the average lifter, I think it's pretty even because I think of the average lifter yeah. that, that adopts mainly bodybuilding stuff mm -hmm. or the average lifter that adopts mainly powerlifting type techniques and, and ideologies. They're both missing out, uh, I, I would say, quite equally on what they could accomplish with their body. Even if your goal is just to be a no, I, I, I don't, think, there, I don't think there's any yeah. debate there. I don't yeah. think there's any debate around uh, the general population getting equal value from both. I, I mean, you could throw in mobility and sports performance yeah. training in there right with that too and make the same case. Sure. If you're just an average gym goer who is just trying to be healthy and strong and fit and mobile and active and you know minimal to no joint pain, then cycling through all of those yeah. modalities is ideal for that person and miss in and not doing one of them uh you're 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 missing out on tremendous benefits but i'm thinking at the the highest, the highest level, level who is who would get the the most benefit mm. for the carryover so like I, if you took a top level bodybuilder versus a top level power right lifter, and and mm -hmm. say they I both can see that argument right and they both neglected that the, the you know yeah. not training like the other one who gets the most benefit from that uh, and i i guess I'm also speaking from personal experience because you were in that you were in the bodybuilding yeah. space, right? I was always in that, even when I was not like competing. Yeah, um, I was always in the the the, the business of sculpting my physique, or yeah. that's what I cared about the most. Yeah. It's it is it is interesting how um, both spaces can almost sometimes show disdain or make fun of the other space. Sure, right? Like yeah. the bodybuilders will look at the power. Oh, look you're fat or you're not, you know, developing this, or I don't care how much you lift or whatever. And the power lifts look at bodybuilders. You guys are weak. Yeah. You know, Oh, that's nice. You look good, but yeah. Can you, know, you do this? Yeah. Can you do this yeah. or that? Yeah. It, it's, um, it's really interesting. I do want to be clear because someone might get confused and think this is about exercises. Oh, power lifters do these exercise bodybuilders. To some extent that's true, but that's not what we're talking about. No. What we're talking about is take the same exercises, how they move the weight. That's it. I don't <laughs> care what the exercise is. In fact, there is a heavy, make heavyweight feel light mentality, and there's a make lightweight feel heavy mentality that you can apply to any exercise that you can do in strength training. I don't care what the exercise, you could be a curl, you can make a heavyweight feel light with a curl, or you can make a lightweight feel heavy with a curl, mm -hmm. and that's what we're talking about. So, because I think we've made the case enough on our podcast that the, all these ex all exercises have value and that the big yeah. compound lifts probably have the most value. But man, can you do a squat, a deadlift, a bench press, an overhead press, which we consider like the big four, right? Can you do them with completely different intent, make them feel and look completely different based on what we're talking about? Yes. Absolutely. 100% yes. And so that's what we're talking about. And so what you could do with your workout is 
without even changing the exercises, <clears throat> you could go in there with one type of mentality or another type of mentality. Yeah. And what you'll get out of both are pros and cons. And it's important to know what the strengths and weaknesses are because then what happens is you could take your programming and knowing the strengths and weaknesses, you can phase your training, you can mold your training so that you, and this is what, this is always the goal with, with exercise programming. This is what makes really good coaches. This is what makes great coaches, great coaches is they know how to maximize the pros and minimize the cons. No. Shitty programming does the opposite, minimizes the pros, maximizes the cons, right? So that's what we're really talking about. Because I know people are going to think, oh, well, it's the exercises. No, it's the intent. No, no. I mean, this really, to me, highlights a seasoned uh, lifter, one that has this ability. And I know we're, we're mainly talking about you know, the, the, the power lifter and bodybuilder mindset, but I, I would throw athletic training in there also. Totally. Because I think that, you know, learning to come in with that, you, you could do, and again, with athletic training, uh, if we were to add that to this, this group, you, you could do all the same exercises, but, uh, they, they, they end up being completely different w with the mindset that you go into it. In Just fact, simply how you go about the exercise. In fact, I would compare heavy and light to what we're saying with athletic training to maximum performance to correctional exercise. Because maximum uh, performance yeah, sure. mm -hmm. is is very much like making heavyweight feel light. Mm -hmm. Correctional exercise is very much like making lightweight feel heavy. Mm -hmm. So it's a very very similar That's a good uh, analogy. A similar comparison. Yeah. That's why this is such a good general category that applies to all uh, strength training pursuits. And depending on what your goal is and how you're working towards that goal. You'll spend more time in one versus the other, but everybody should spend some time in both. Well, and this is important because I, I'm realizing that we get more calls of people that will apply the same type of mindset going into other programs that have a very similar structure of exercises. Um, and they're looking at it from the way that they would approach those same reps with that heavy mindset, right? right. Like they're trying to move the weight as effectively as possible when in fact we've increased the number of reps when in fact the whole protocol is different and more geared towards you know that lighter mindset making the lightweight heavy yeah. uh, so it's it's an important concept to to bring into your workout totally what's up everybody here's the giveaway for today's episode maps aesthetic this is the bodybuilding style maps program and it's free for you if you do this and if you win Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we do, if you do all three of those things and we like your comment, we'll notify you only in the comment section. We'll tell you that you won the, that program for free. Now, uh, everybody else, we got a sale going on right now. Check this out. Map Symmetry, 50% off. And Map Strong, 50% off. So both real popular programs, both half off. If you want to sign up or learn more, Click on the link at the top of the description below to get started. All right, here comes the show. All right, so let's talk about heavy for a second. So what makes uh, heavy weight feel light? Um, it's maximizing efficiency, maximizing efficiency. So when I'm lifting a weight, by the way, I, again, I want to be clear, in both scenarios, I am not talking about crappy form. In fact, good form is important for both of them. So again, I don't want people to get confused and be like, oh, maximizing efficiency, I'm going to make this shitty form so I can move the weight. No, that doesn't work. In fact, if you have shitty form with heavy weight, you're going to hurt yourself. So it's always good form, but the intent's different. You're maximizing efficiency of the lift when you're trying to make heavy weight feel light. So what does that mean? That means you're moving the bar in a way that allows you to max to lift as much weight as possible with as minimal effort as possible with your body. You're looking for no leaks in energy. You're not looking for feeling a muscle squeeze. Like when you're bench pressing a heavy weight and you're trying to make it feel light, what you're not doing is saying, let me feel this in this part of my pec or in my triceps or my shoulder. You don't care about that. No. The goal is how can I lift this weight feeling tight, controlled, <clears throat> and efficient? How do I move how do I make this movement yeah. uh it, in a way to where I can move as much weight as possible with as minimal injury of risk. That's and, what I mean by maximizing. And efficiency. you are trying to organize your entire body from head to toe in effort, in that effort. Yes. Which is the opposite of the other. Category, right? Yes. Like you are with it when you are lifting like this, 
you are literally thinking from your toes all the way up to your neck. Yes. How everything is engaged to now move this bench press, this squat, this yeah. snatch, whatever. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's my orchestra versus single uh, instrument sort of analogy thing. Like you have to like make sure that everything is is together and it's in unison versus you know really isolating and trying to find that one instrument that stands. Yeah, what's up. funny? So I'll, we'll get to the 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 other side here for a second, but just to use a simple example, I was thinking about if you're doing like a row, let's say you're doing a barbell row or dumbbell row, and you're trying to make heavyweight feel light, you've got a I'll just use one example. You've got a hard grip on that dumbbell or that bar. You are squeezing the shit out of it and you're moving that weight. You'll often see bodybuilders who are trying to make lightweight feel heavy use a grip like this yeah. where the bar is at the ends of their fingertips yeah. or they'll do a curl sometimes like this with the wrist cocked back right. with barely where you're not going to be able to lift nearly as much weight with that. But what they're trying to do is disengage certain muscles to feel other muscles. Whereas if you're making heavyweight feel light, you're like, Turn everything on. Yeah. Let's go. I want mm -hmm. all the muscles I can help me move this. Totally. Yeah, and I mean, you're considering when you're moving heavy weight too, how you have to anchor your body and how you have to create these ground forces and, and create, uh, basically make sure that no rotation happens within any joint. You yes. know, for certain types of movements. And so it's like becoming as rigid as possible throughout your whole body. So that way now we can perform uh, a very vertical line uh, as effectively and efficiently as possible. Totally. So what's the focus uh, feel like for this? Well, if you've ever watched a, a powerlifting meet, um, it can actually be kind of weird if you've never done powerlifting, maybe even intimidating. Lots of face slapping and smelling ammonia <laughs> and, uh, you know, angry yeah. music. And you are psyching yes. yourself up. Hyping up. You are going in and you are like, ah, oh, because you're, tr you're trying to do is you're trying to get your CNS as fired up as possible. And then when you get under the bar or you you grab the dumbbells, it's like turn everything on and let's go, right? And lift the weight. It's a very different focus from, you know, when you lift a, a lighter weight to try to make it feel heavy. You are going in there and you are like, go through this weight, make it happen, and make it happen in a, in a, in a very efficient uh, possible way possible. This is important to understand because the focus that goes into your lift will contribute greatly to, to the type of lift that you do and the kind of results that you get from it. Oh, I think that the rituals that people like to do before lifts uh, bode themselves well here as yes. in, in comparison to the other group. Like, in fact, I didn't even ever really get into that until I started like power lifting until I started trying to lift singles and doubles. And did I ever get into this, like little, how I walk up to the bar, right. how I you know, position my feet, my hips, what I do with yeah. my arms. Like you need that to replicate. I, yeah, I never did that. that I, I, I trained for over 10 years. Uh, of just getting on the bar and actually thinking like what Sal said, relaxing a lot of parts of my body. Yeah. Like, oh, opening the wrist up, relaxing. Okay, just just think about the chest and not trying to tense up anything. So mm. there wasn't this like ritual to get onto the bench. Like, so I bench so different today because it is this kind of combination of a power lifter and a bodybuilder. Yeah. Now. So I have this like, get under there, get wedged under, get ground my feet real tight, but then pull off like a bodybuilder relax the way yeah. down so it's it's really so if someone were to pick me apart like that they would totally make fun of me because i i don't really identify as one or the other it's that i've taken some things that i really like from what i learned from training like a power lifter and then things that i've learned from training like a bodybuilder and i've combined it makes it and it makes your workout so much more effective. for sure what are some of the pros of lifting like this again we're talking about the average person here okay lifting like this really does a great job of building overall muscle you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to build more general overall muscle in your body because of the sheer tension that's involved when you're moving maximal weight. So it's not just that. It's And it's something that you said, and I used to repeat it all the time after you said it because it was like the first time I'd ever heard anybody say it this way, and I, and I haven't repeated it in a long time, is when you used to give the, the uh, amplifier analogy to the speakers. Yeah. I love that analogy, and I never thought about – powerlifting and training like you know where you're trying to really fire the cns and and basically i'm i'm investing in in building my central nervous system it's efficient turning up yeah. that amplitude and, and anybody who who understands how uh, speakers work knows that you can have the most expensive baddest hugest subwoofers in the world but if you have some cheap ass you know 
two hundred watt uh, amplifier, you ain't gonna get shit yeah. out of those speakers. And in fact, most people that really understand stereo says it would argue that the amplifier and tuner is the most valuable part of the speaker system. And so I and I that's why I love that analogy you gave on because I think like when you when you get into training like a power lifter, you are really learning how to build an efficient central nervous system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and that's what I felt I got out of training this way was I now learned how to call upon my muscles like I never have before because I had never put a lot of effort towards the amplifier. Yeah. I'd always put this effort towards the speakers. Yes. Right. And you get so much more effective and efficient at energy management. So when you're moving around, you are able to apply that instant, the the maximum amount of force that you need, but not no more. Yep. Right. And, and you're able to relax your body and move fluidly. So it, it definitely applies to athletics as well as it does power lifting. Um, so, I mean, that's just something that will apply to a lot more real world situations too, because you have to organize your entire body a lot of times to lift something off the ground, to put something overhead. So a lot more real world kind of functional strength. That yeah. So people are like, well, what do you mean by functional strength? I've heard people say that it's all functional. You're all, yeah. Okay. Technically that's true. However, in the real world, when you're moving couches and boxes and your TV and whatever, you're not trying to make those things feel heavier. You no. want to make them feel lighter. Yeah. So this kind of training, Lee, it, 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 it lends itself better to real world applicable strength. Because if you've ever worked with a blue collar worker and you've ever done hard labor with them, what you see with them, I mean, you, I've worked with men in their 60s doing stuff like this. And what you see is like incredible um, efficiency. Like they can do things that I can't because they've learned how to become so efficient. Well, not to mention, it. they don't give a shit how good your chest li- looks. They want to make sure you can pick up That's your it. end. Yeah. <laughs> you lifting a couch. I don't give a shit your pecs look good if you can't help, help with your end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I say you lift the couch, you're not thinking like come lats. Blue, right? Right? Yeah, you're not like, like hey, yeah. your chest looks really good, bro. No, nobody yeah. cares. Like, pick up the couch and let's move it. Let's make this happen. It builds a very solid body. I have no no... Like there, I don't think there's any studies that support this, but this is this has been you know I don't know strength training anecdote or wisdom for decades, which is training in this way tends to produce this very granite hard, solid feeling body. Now bodybuilders in the 60s and 70s, they would go through powerlifting cycles because they would say the same thing. Like Arnold would say, it gives me a granite look to my body, so it does tend to build this really solid tight, strong, dense looking body from a visual standpoint. I remember Adam, when you were bodybuilding and you switched over to the style of training just for a short period of time, you even commented that it made your body feel that way or look that way. So it's really interesting. It's a, I it's would, interesting I would argue to the death of me that there's a, a, a huge difference yes. in it. And I, and I don't know if it's more about the heavy lifting or it's more about training for the pump is more about fluid that you're teaching your body to be able to hold in cells. And so that gives you this, uh, temporary, uh, temporary, temporary, uh, inflation or look Mm -hmm. to the muscle versus lifting really heavy weight gives you kind of this permanent look that's, and that's how I would describe it to somebody on like what I notice a difference. Like when I trained like a bodybuilder for so many years, I used to always have this feeling of, man, when I drank all the fluid and, and got in there and I lifted, I looked I looked twice my size. But then 20 minutes later, that would all kind of air out. And then I feel like I did, you could barely tell I really lifted that much. That's how I felt, right? And it wasn't until I started powerlifting that I get this look where I built muscle. And maybe I didn't look as filled out as the pump look gave me, but it looked like I built legitimate muscle that didn't need to be aired up to look bigger. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like that, mm-hmm. that was the way. And, and so I don't know if that's more. That's the theory. The theory is that the, the actual contractual tissue, the muscle fibers grow more with this kind of training versus the other style, which also grows muscle fiber, but also adds to all of the non-muscle fiber structures in muscle, glycogen, fluid, capillaries, all the which also makes up the size. I mean, 70% of your muscle is not muscle fiber. It's all that other stuff. So that's the theory. We don't have any evidence, like scientific evidence to support it, but we've got decades of strength athletes talking about 
you know, this particular well, thing. Well, I think to um that besides the back that's definitely an obvious one to see you know a different style of training you could see somebody who's probably doing more power lifting and compound lifts uh you know what that does to their back but really their core uh, is, is very much something that stands out and um just seeing somebody that's um you know more a little more focused on the heavy end you can see what that does to their obliques you can see what that does to everything you know in their back and their rectors like it's just it, it's one of those things that if you don't do it you just don't see a pronounced visual representation of that as right much. all right now so talk about the cons now so what are the, it's everybody's like, oh this is great this is how i want to train all the time uh not so fast there's some cons one of them is a uh, higher injury risk for sure yeah this style of training Risk reward. is far more prone to injury, far more prone to injury because with this style of training, you're always pushing the limits of how much weight you can lift. And yes, you are trying to maximize efficiency, but as the weight gets heavier and heavier, the smallest of inefficiencies in your lift can produce high risks of injury. I mean, if you're squatting 500 pounds and your technique is off by a half a degree um, that could hurt you right away. I mean, you could totally get hurt. You're pushing heavy weight. You're pulling heavy weight. You're you're firing your CNS. You're psyching yourself up. You're and and so the risk of injury just because the weight, the sheer weight, even with good form. I mean, a perfect form with the same lifter, right? Mm -hmm. A perfect form, 500 pound squat has a higher injury risk than a perfect form, 200 pound squat. Obviously, with the same lifter, even if they make the 200 pound squat feel heavy with what we're about to talk about. So the risk of injury is much higher. The other part is training this way tends to definitely, definitely stresses the connective tissue, the ligaments and the tendons mm -hmm. much more because those are things that the muscle anchors to. And so what you'll find if you train like this all the time, all the time, all the time, is you just start to get sore Wear joints and, and you start to get sore at the insertion points. I would, I would add another con to this. Um, I find... Uh, this one feeds the ego more. Therefore, it's tougher for me to move away from it after I'm in it, if that makes sense. Because when I when I'm hitting PRs and I'm I'm seeing weight on the bar more than I ever have, I like that. And I'm not even a powerlifting guy. I'm a bodybuilder guy. Yeah. And yet when I see like, oh man, this is the most weight I've ever squatted. Oh, this is the most I did lift it. I want to keep going. I want to stay in that. It's difficult for me to tell myself like, I need to move away from this. I would, you know what? This is a good point. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, I'll, but I'll say this. I'll, I'm, I'm going to agree, but I'm also going to bring it to the point because I think it could be both sides. Yeah. I think when you're bulking, this is great. When you're cutting, I don't mess with your ego. If I'm trying to get, if I'm trying to get leaner and I'm trying to lift heavy, mm. now my ego is getting mm. hurt. Mm -hmm. If I'm, trying to bulk with the make the lightweight feel heavy thing. And I'm all interested in body sculpting. That's when it messes with my ego. So I think they both can mess with your ego, depending on the way mm. you're training and maybe even the individual. I do right? see the, the big ego attachment there of PRs uh, because yeah. it, it is a big focus is yeah. the loading of the weight. And then, but on the other end of it, I've, obviously you'll see the ego come out through the size of your muscle and the sure. visual of yeah. it, right? So it's it's interesting to think about it, but it's well, definitely there. I mean, obviously I'm speaking from personal experience, right? So everyone has probably their their own journey. Um, but I've, I've lived in both spaces spaces, I would think that I, I actually identify as a bodybuilder type of person more than I do a, 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 a power lifter. Yeah, no doubt. It's hard to see the weight go down. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And, and, and even for a guy who doesn't care about that as much, it's, it, it you can get, you can get, uh, uh, in that race to keep putting more and more when you start seeing numbers go up or seeing numbers that you've never seen before, even though I know better, it's time for me to move out. So, personally, I would list that as an added con. I never have that problem with bodybuilding. When I'm lifting like a bodybuilder and I'm trying to make light weight feel heavy, weight becomes arbitrary to me. Yeah. So moving to low reps, high reps, being low carb, high carb. Don't oh, matter. I'm weak. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. I'm all in my mind. I'm always weak. Like I'm, I'm yeah. always trying to make myself feel weak, no matter what is on the bar when I'm, when I'm in full bodybuilder mode. But when I'm in powerlifting mode, strength guy, I am looking at the weight. 
And that's actually one of my best indicators of like, oh, I'm moving the weight good because I'm getting stronger yeah, and stronger. Yeah. So I find that one of the cons is that it's hard to move away from it because the the chasing the weight on the bar can become very addictive. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. All right, so let's talk about making lightweight feel heavy. All right, so now what you're trying to do, okay, in the context of good form, rather than maximizing efficiency, you're actually trying to maximize inefficiency. I'm trying to make the weight feel he as heavy as possible. Can I make these 20 pound dumbbells with this overhead press fry my shoulders yeah. like if I was lifting 60 pound dumbbells? And and you can do this if you get really good at this. Bodybuilders are the best at this. A really, really good bodybuilder could work out with weight that you would look at and be like, why are they using such lightweight? And yet they'd get a phenomenal workout and a crazy pump. It's all about maximizing the inefficiency of the exercise. So that example, like you could see one way uh, to achieve that is to not fully lock out. So they maintain this muscle tension. <laughs> That's why they'll start uh, doing that. So they'll start doing things like that that'll show up uh, to really stress the muscle even more the entire um, set of reps that you're doing. Uh, and then also like tempo will show up in angles, yeah. uh, lots and lots of angles. Yeah. Well, I like and, that. Uh, uh, tempo is a big one. Yeah. That to me, that that's what, like, again, going back to what I was saying before about like weight is, it doesn't matter anymore to me because it doesn't matter what exercise I'm doing. It's going to be heavy. So do like, like th th what I love about this is that when I'm training with this mindset and I come to the gym, and I put weight on the bar. It actually doesn't matter if I got good sleep or bad sleep or that. I can st and I can start with a what could be, or maybe I got great sleep. And I feel really mm -hmm. doesn't matter. I put one thirty five on the bar, and one thirty five, I'm gonna make heavy. Yes. No matter what, whether I had great sleep, not good sleep, or, or is it naturally already heavy because I didn't get those things, or maybe I got great sleep and fully fed, and so it feels light. It doesn't matter. It's gonna end up feeling heavy because I'll mess with tempo, which is how I used to teach people with form. Like I would always, when a client would ask me, oh, let's go up and wait. This is easy for me. I say, oh, then we'll just slow down the last three to four reps. Let's make it heavy. Let's take those last ones slow. And, and I would manipulate tempo all the time to make these weights. Heavy. Actually, we, good. Two things I want to uh, point out. One is I, I forgot to mention this con with the heavy, making heavy weight feel light, which is it's hard to bring up lagging body parts with this hmm. because you're, because you're making an exercise as efficient as possible. If that means when you squat, you engage your quads more than your glutes, so be it. That's what's going to end up happening. Right. So then you may underdevelop your glutes, and that's what ends up happening. And if you continue to train by making heavy weight feel light, well, you're going to continue to use this pattern that works best for your body, meaning you're not going to bring up the slagging body part. Well, now when we get to the lightweight, the goal is to focus on the target muscle. This is So when we talk about tempo and we talk about you know maximizing inefficiency, really what this is, it's all about the feel. It's all about the feel. So if I'm doing a squat heavy to make it feel light, I don't give. I don't care if I feel my quads, hamstrings, or my glutes, or whatever. Let's just move it in the way that moves the weight the best. Yeah. Okay. When I'm bodybuilding or I'm doing this, make lightweight feel heavy. I'm thinking what muscle I'm trying to work. I'm trying to work my glutes. All right. Let's make the squat. Let's put this light weight on the bar, and let's move in a way with a slow tempo. But also, this is the most important part because you could do slow tempo and still do this wrong. You could go slow tempo and still train without targeting what you're trying to target. It's all about the feel, 100% about the feel. Not the feel like, how do I make this weight feel light, but rather, how do I feel the muscles that I'm trying to work? By the way, studies show this. Studies show this quite clearly that when people do this, they do activate mm -hmm. target, quote unquote, target muscles even better. So this is all about feeling the muscle versus heavy weight where it's not about feeling the muscle at all. It's all about feeling the movement. So this allows you to target and squeeze specific parts of your body. This is when you can take an exercise like a row and I can make it hit my lats. Mm -hmm. I can make it hit my rhomboids or mid trapezius. Or if I want to, I can even make a row of my biceps more than my, than all those other muscles. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things they talk about is the mind-muscle connection. This is where I always got the most value from this, especially like introducing it to clients as well. Is just, yeah, you slow the tempo down, but really you do have a lot of control as to how many muscle fibers you recruit based on how much you're focused on that muscle group and how much squeeze and uh, feel that you can produce. Uh, so it's, it's very valuable in a sense to figure out 
you know, if there are, you know, maybe some weak areas, maybe some, some muscle groups that are underdeveloped that we can then direct all our focus there. And we can really like uh, make a, a massive impact by focusing mind muscle uh, to that area. Well, this is why too, bringing us to the second point, why the focus is so different getting up to lift, right? So I'm getting ready to power lift. I have this ritual, you know, the way I step up, the way I grip the floor, what I do with my arms, what I, like this whole ritual to come in the bar. When I'm thinking of bodybuilder, I'm actually already thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm already, before I even get to the bar, I'm flexing the muscles that I'm going to go hit. Yeah. Because I want to make sure I'm 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 co- I'm so like connected. Priming them for it. Yeah, I'm already connected so mm-hmm. well that I can I can I can activate my back just thinking about it. Yeah. So I'm gonna get ready. I'm gonna go do a bent over row right now, and I'm already I'm already starting to fire my back mm-hmm. without any resistance because I know when I get under that bar, that's I want to think about that the entire time. So the the thought process and the even the the walk up to the bar is a, a different process than what it is when I'm getting ready to just rip the most weight I'm trying it's to do. It's calm focus. Yeah. Whereas with the heavy weight, it's like angry, you know, yeah. psych up. Yeah. It's totally different. You ever watch videos of lifters like, rah, and they yell, and rah, and that's like, let's go move some heavy weight. When it goes to like bodybuilding style, it's like quiet and it's calm and it's focused. I'm not trying to get over, in fact, over psyching myself up with making lightweight feel heavy ruins the exercise. If I go to do a squat and I want to just feel it in my glutes, if I over psych myself up, I'm going to not feel it in the target muscles. I'm just going to move the weight hella easy and I'm going to have to add weight to it versus I got to go in there calm. It's just still focused, but you're calm focused and I'm visualizing the muscle. I'm visualizing the action of the muscle. Okay. The glutes extend at the hips. That's the movement that I'm trying to really focus on. Even though I'm doing knee extension with a squat too, I'm focusing more on hip extension, right? Or when I'm benching, right? Okay, I want to feel it in the chest. What does the chest do, right? That's that's this what's called adduction of the humerus. It's bringing the humerus closer to the center of my body. So I'm getting under the bar, calm, focused. And when I push the bar, it's almost like I'm trying to disengage the triceps. I'm trying to just make the chest do the work. I'm literally, like we're saying in this episode, making the lightweight feel as heavy as possible. I also focus way more on the eccentric portion than I do. Totally. Because Yeah, there's like no eccentric. <laughs> right. Well, I mean it's still eccentric, but it's I all mean, about they are, but it's tight. controlled. It's yeah. just not like Yeah, focus. it's less it's less it's less important. Yeah. When you're trying to move as much weight as possible, you you not you're not necessarily trying to resist it as slow as you can and activate that muscle on the way down. If anything, you're trying to conserve energy on the in eccentric you're trying to portion. Stay with, you're yes. trying to do what's called stay in the groove yeah. with your yep. eccentric. Whereas right. with, with this, I'm resisting is, it. Can I still feel the target yeah. muscle? I'm trying to resist it, which there is an art to that. Like it's it's relatively easy for the average lifter to fill a muscle on the concentric portion because yeah. they're, you're, you're contracting that muscle. So it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I feel the bicep. But when you let it go down, can you resist it with the bicep? Or it's real easy to press with your chest because you need those muscles to press it off. But then can you resist it with the chest on the way down right. and not allow all those other muscles to kick in? There's the art to this. And there's where that focus comes in. So when you come into a lift and I'm thinking like a bodybuilder, a lot of my focus is on the eccentric portion of the exercise and staying connected to that muscle during that entire. And to me, that is one of the, the biggest glaring differences when I look yeah. at like my powerlifter friends standing next to a bodybuilder when if you if you pick apart their eccentric portion of the exercise you go oh it's you yeah. can tell it's yeah. and it's and you got to use com- using use compound lists for this example because I think it's easier to visualize because everybody's like well with a curl I could feel well, okay uh try doing a row and on the way down can you feel the lats on the way down or do you just lower the bar? So what a, what a, when you're making heavyweight feel light, what you're trying to do is you're trying to lower the bar in the efficient groove, get it into the groove so that I can push it up, right? When you're trying to feel the muscle, you're like, can I lower this while still feeling the target muscle? Yeah. This is a very, uh, this is a skill, by the way. Both of these are skills. I want to, I want to be very clear. Both of what we're talking about are skills that you develop through practice. And when you develop them and okay, here's your evidence right here. Take an athlete that always trains heavy, put them in a bodybuilding workout, and watch them do lifts. And you and and bodybuilders will be like, man, that guy is not targeting 
the rear delt. That guy's not hitting his lats. That guy's not. Then take a po- bodybuilder, have him do powerlifting, and you watch him do a squat or a deadlift, and it's like, what are they doing? They're they're individual. They're making they're moving each muscle individually. Why aren't they maximizing the lift or whatever? It's a skill. So practicing both of these gets you good at both of them. By the way, this makes you a master at strength training. Essentially, yeah. If you can, if, both. if you can do that in a compound lift, you are you are getting close to mastery. I think of lifting. I actually used to tr- teach it with an an. Uh, uh, an isolation exercise. Tricep pushdowns were my favorite. Mm. Try and I know you guys have had so many clients that do a tricep pushdown. Everybody fills it on the way down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But resisting it on the way back, they let the cable yeah, 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 yeah. take it, take it up, or they tense their bicep up, or they tense their shoulders up, yeah. and they're like they don't feel it in their tricep at all. So it's one of my favorite ways to teach what I'm trying to communicate right now on what we're trying to do in every exercise. So if we're doing chest right now, all the checks are to do it. I want you thinking on the way down, resisting with the chest. We're doing these tricep pushdowns, resisting it with the triceps. And if you've never trained this way, and you apply this, I swear you get massive benefits from, I mean, research has already shown that the eccentric portion is one of the most valuable portions as far as building muscle. Yes. But part of that research is, is taking into consideration you're doing it properly. If you're not, if you're not resisting properly with, with your triceps on a tricep extension, then that you, you're not going to make the case. That's that, the key right there is yeah, you're, you're doing a negative with heavy weight, but are you building the target muscle? Or are you just getting better at that exercise? Right. Right? Because here's here's the pros of making lightweight feel heavy. This is how you bring up lagging body parts. It, you know, By the way, people who have lagging body parts and they work out regularly, now sometimes it's because they don't train that body part. So sometimes it's like, yeah, my calves aren't developed, but and you're like, well, do you work out your calves? Well, no, barely. But oftentimes it's like, man, I can't build my glutes but I squat and I deadlift and I do single leg deadlifts and I do this and I, you know, oh, but I can't develop my, my lats, but I do pull-ups and rows and whatever. I can't build my chest. I do all these different chest presses. And that's because they're not doing this very well, which is making that lightweight feel heavy and changing the focus. This kind of lifting is great for bringing up lagging body parts, as opposed to what we talked about earlier, which can be terrible for bringing up lagging body parts. Like if you could bench press a lot of weight, but you don't have a well-developed chest, just continuing to bench press heavy weight means your body's going to lift it the best way it knows how, which is not use the chest very much, right? If you could squat really well, but your glutes aren't developed, um, and going heavy isn't going to make your glutes grow anymore because you're just going to do it the way you've always done it. So going light and focusing on those areas and the feel now allows you to really create that tension in that target body part. So this kind of lifting is great. This is when you want to bring up a lagging body part. This is exactly what you do. Mm-hmm. is you lighten the load and then you focus on the feel. And here's another pro. This is much lower injury risk, much lower injury risk. Oh, yeah. Like the pe- like the bodybuilders who are still training in their 60s and 70s and whatever and with no injuries, this is how they always trained. They always trained by making lightweight feel heavy. They always trained with this type of mentality and they tend to not get injuries. The bodybuilders with all the injuries, you know, I hate to say it, they're the ones that really went super heavy all the time. I'm talking extreme because you could do both and keep them relatively safe. But to be quite honest, the injury risk is much lower with this kind of training. Well, this is the most appealing part of training this way, in my opinion. Uh, it means that I could l- virtually sculpt the, the physique that I want right. with the least amount of risk. That's what makes it so appealing. That's what made it so appealing to me forever. So training this way puts me at the least amount of resi- uh, risk, and I also have the capability to build the best body I could, I possibly can, sculpting my physique, mm-hmm. which it is way more difficult to do that with a, a power lifter. As I get mental. older, because I like heavy lifting. I've always liked heavy lifting. As I get older, I appreciate this style of training more because of that right there. Because yeah. at some point, you start to reach certain levels of strength where the injury risk just gets higher Mm -hmm. if your form isn't absolutely perfect or whatever. And so this type of training becomes more appealing as I get older where, you know, now I'm more focused on this style of training versus when I was in my twenties and thirties. Yeah. Well, to your earlier point, like you just start to feel that, that stress and tension on your ligaments and your joints, uh, doing the heavy lifting over, you know, a long course of time, it just adds up and, and, 
stresses it out versus this uh, type of mentality. It's just, it's one of those things like, because you're getting more blood circulation too, and you're doing more reps, like there's, there's a bit of a healing element there as well that I've noticed, like, you know, switching it over from doing that heavy, you know, uh, high risk style training versus this. Right. Now let's talk about some cons, right? So it's great. You can hit those target body parts and there's less injury risk, but here's the deal. It's true, and this is you know more so for people who are beginner, intermediate. Like once you get super advanced, um, then then this is less of a, a con. But this is in the beginning. It's you're just not going to build as much muscle. It's just total muscle, right? So if I take two lifters who are getting you know who only have maybe six months of lifting experience, and one person I talk, I teach them just to feel the muscle and squeeze the muscle with every single lift, and the other one I'm like, let's maximize. Your, your your exercise efficiency and really learn how to lift as much weight as possible, the person lifting most weight is going to build the most total muscle. It's just a fact. It just does that. So it's this this isn't as much of a big muscle builder, which is probably why, Adam, you said the bodybuilders in the beginning would benefit a lot from powerlifting style training because they would just gain new muscle from training in this particular way. Yeah, I, I, and I also think that it's it's kind of compounding, right? If you get to, for example, like if I've never squatted over 225 trying to focus on, let's say, building my glutes because I trained always like a bodybuilder and I never went through a powerlifting phase that pushed me over 400, I can never go back and do 315 and control and focus on my ah, squats. Good point. You understand what I'm saying? Like yep. if you always train with the, oh, weight doesn't matter like I did for so long, you never really push those boundaries to new limits on your body. I'm always floating around, let's say, with the 225 squat That's and true. just slowing the tempo down. Good just point. And so – what what it opened for me was, and I and I know I use squats and glutes, which was not really a focus of mine. It probably would have been better for me was my back analogy, right? Like, it really opened up the amount of mass that I could build on my back because I had never pushed weights like four or five hundred pounds in a deadlift. So all of a sudden, now I I could. It took me forever, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but for this for making my point, I let's say I was rowing like on a seated row where I could really activate my lats and think about the muscles, you know, with, you know, 150, let's say, I would say that was like a, a heavy, heavy weight, but light enough that I could really control rolling the shoulders, feeling in my lats. And that was probably at my peak strength. After I stopped rowing, did nothing but deadlifting, got really strong. I got up to 550 pounds deadlifting. Then I come back I could do that same controlled rowing with like 225 yeah. pounds. Mm -hmm. And so it now allows me to train like a bodybuilder connecting to these muscles with a, 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 a higher stress than yeah. I ever could before. And it opened that for me where I don't think that bodybuilding would have done the same Good for the point. powerlifter. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's that systemic effect, right? Versus sort of a localized approach. And, um, and there's a lot of muscle groups and, and, uh, stabilizer type muscles that uh, you you probably aren't stressing enough doing you know a more bodybuilder style training uh, whereas like you every everything it gets affected because it's it's all up the kinetic chain you have to ground yourself you have to brace your spine like there's just more demand uh, going in that direction uh, which you do get sort of that carryover of of more muscle mass as a result I think I definitely think it's that and I think a big portion of it is going back to the amplifier analogy yeah yeah I upgraded my amplifier like I never have before I've had the I, your capacity I built the big increased. you know 12 inch or whatever subwoofers forever that were top of the line that were awesome because I put years and years and years into making those, but I had been running off the same amp for forever. And for the first time in my life, I upgraded my amp and I didn't just kind of upgrade it. I upgraded it to a whole nother level. And, and, and now that amp could, could blow those speakers out the water. Now it gives me the opportunity to go build 18 inch subwoofers or 20 inch that's subwoofers. A very good point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what's so amazing about that. So I think a lot of that goes back to the, the CNS more than, if I had to attribute what I think it was the, the probably the most value. I would that. agree. Mm -hmm. And, and, and lastly, um, the strength that you build training this way is just less applicable to the real world because as I said earlier in the real world the last thing you want to do when you're using strength when you have to use strength is make something make harder light be. feel heavy yeah. like, you don't want to make light things feel heavy in the real world because in the real world I'm not trying to develop my biceps and my rear delts and my rhomboids and my traps when I'm moving a table or a couch 
or you know doing something that requires some strength. I'm trying to do the opposite. It, but if I always train my body to feel heavy, lightweight, feel heavy, then when I go try to move heavy things in the real world, I don't have the skill. I don't have the skill to do so. And this is where sometimes bodybuilders get a bad rap, where bodybuilders will go and, and, and they'll go do something physical or whatever. And people will be like, my God, that guy's 250 pounds and he's not, he's not that, you know, he looks like he's way stronger than he really is. Really what it is is, they got the muscle. They just don't have the the ability. They don't have the skill of of doing what we're you know what we're kind of talking about. So, if you want to build applicable strength, then the other style of training is going to give you more of that than this. But I think the big point to make is this: is if you plan on making strength training something that you do for long for a long period of time, or or hopefully for the rest of your life, these both of these are equally important. Both of them have pros and cons. And again, the key is to maximize the pros, minimize the cons. In plain speak, what does that look like? Well, it looks like phasing in and phasing out of each one of these styles of training. Three to six weeks in one, three to six weeks in another one. And what do you get with that? More consistent progress, less injury, and a better looking physique. Look, if you like Mind Pump, uh, you got to check out mindpumpfree.com. That's where we have all of our free guides that can help with lots of health and fitness goals. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.